you're listening to This Week in Property. Stay current, relevant and up to date in the world of property investment. Learn from the UK's leading property professionals and grow your property business. Hello and welcome to This Week in Property. I'm your host Richard Swan and in today's show I have sat down with Mr Paul Barry and we discussed a very, very lesser known financial product, financial service, financial solution. We actually kind of struggle to put a label on it as well. It's a thing called a SAS. That's S-S-A-S. And you know something, I was going to spell it out there, but I won't. I'll keep the mystery hanging in the air. Are you one of the many, many, many business people in the UK that have not heard of a SAS? If you're in that massive camp, then you are in for a treat today because this is a product that pretty much every business owner should know about. When it comes to raising finance, when it comes to leverage, when it comes to being able to invest in your own business, invest in third party businesses, buy things outright such as commercial property, such as land development deals, etc., this is a, a tool, a service, a product which has absolutely remarkable flexibility and power within it and the whole thing is arranged, approved, stamped, given blessing, <laughs> legally endorsed, you name it, all the other phrases you might want to throw in there by none other than HMRC. Yes, that's right, HMRC. The people who are used to kind of coming to steal your taxes, they are involved heavily and have very much approved this scheme, this service, this system uh, that you can use to dramatic effect to, to really improve, grow, develop your business. And it incorporates a lot of power that you can pull in from Previous pension schemes as well, because like a lot of business owners uh, around the country, you may well have been involved in previous corporate schemes, you know, employee schemes, etc. All of these pension schemes just wasting away with pathetic returns and you can't get your hands on them, you can't use them effectively, you've got these amazing skills as a businesswoman or businessman, you know exactly how to employ your money to a fantastic degree and get great returns on them and yet you're not allowed to use your own pension. You're handcuffed, you're kept at bay from this pot of cash very, very slowly building up over time until you get to those, you know, those milestones that, you know, the 55 and above to get a certain portion of it tax free. Uh, After your retirement age, whenever that's, you know, indoctrinated for yourself, then you can start to use it in a very, very limited fashion. Well, a SAS... A SAS takes that world and turns it upside down. Incredibly, as you'll hear from Paul, it's a thing that's been in existence for over 40 years, 40 years, and yet it must be one of the best kept secrets in the financial industry in the UK. So I sat down with Paul and I grilled him, interviewed him, chatted with him, took him off in tangents, all the usual stuff you would expect from a conversation on This Week in Property. And it was actually done for a very specific reason. We filmed the entire thing because the full interview, the full package, is actually for a very exclusive section in our property vault at PMW uh, for all of our property protégé students. And of course, you'll, most listeners will have heard me speak about this in the past. If you go to propertyprotégé.com, that gives you a, a clue and insight into some of the teaching, the education, the courses, etc. that we take a lot of people through who want to get involved in the world of property, involved in the world of business. And we have this vault for them and the general public doesn't see it. And this kind of interview, this kind of amazing resource information, etc. is what we give to our students that have been through Property Protégé. And it's a new section that's going to be in there. There's a, a section in there already about raising finance in many, many different ways. And this SAS piece was just another part of that fantastic library of content. But the interview was so good, we thought, you know, this deserves 
a bit of a wider audience. So let's take parts of it out. Let's extract some of the audio out of this module, this training module for our personal private protege students, and let's put it into one of the This Week in Property shows. So if you hear me talking away, like, that, that sounds like Richard's talking to someone else in the room, or he's talking off camera, or he's, he's talking to a, a different set of listeners or viewers. What's going on there? Oh, that's why. It's because the full thing was filmed, put together for this very special section inside our Property Protégé vault. Again, if you're looking for more information about that, go to propertyprotégé.com. But let's get into it. Let's discover the, the mystique of this financial product that's been in the go for such a long time, but so, so few business owners know about this one, the world of SaaS. So without further ado, give it up for Mr. Paul Barry. Now, this one is financial, raising finance, using finance, and it's about a very specific thing, a product, a solution, I've heard it sometimes called by my guest today, Um, and it's called a SAS, and that's S-S-A-S, Paul, you'll keep me right here, so small, self-administered scheme. Correct, well done. Come on, five points. (laughs) Uh, And it's a tool, it's this amazing tool that business owners can use that people in the property world can use to great effect, but there's lots of things about it. There's quite a few complexities, if we say it that way sometimes. Yeah, okay, just things we need to understand. Don't scare people off. But more importantly, loads of options. Some amazing flexibility around it, uh, which you guys and girls, you'll probably think about it as we chat. You'll think about it from your own perspective. Ah, that's something I could use. Ah, right, okay. I need, to, I need to find out more about this. Or it might be someone you're working with. You might be you know, the property sourcer, the joint venture partner, the business partner, whatever, and you're trying to help someone employ their finance, use it properly, etc. So you're able to start to educate them on that or start to connect them uh, with our expert on that field. And that's what this is about as well, of course. Each section, as you know in the vault, we have our power team that you're building up the solicitor, the builder, the estate agent, the letting agent, and so forth, Uh, IFAs, brokers, you name it. Uh, And those are the experts in that field that you then work with, that you lean on, and they know much more than you, and they can guide you right. And our power team guy in this world of SAS is (laughs) our good friend, Mr. Paul Barry. Hello, Paul. Hello, thank you for that. Thanks for a nice build-up. There we go. Now you need to just, just hit that standard now. Follow it through, right? No, but <laughs> I'll put Let's now, see what can do. Now, before we get into this this world, and oh, there's so much, we'll, we'll probably jump off on all sorts of tangents. I'm sure we will. No doubt mm-hmm. with this thing. Uh, let's talk about you. Let's introduce you to the folks, if they've not seen you before. How would you kind of um, summarise your, your background, your career? What's took you to this point? Yeah, good question. Thank you. So my background is, is 100% been in financial services. I started uh, in banking, dare I say it, not a, not a popular uh, oh, profession these days in the late 80s. Yep. Uh, and in that process, I became a financial advisor uh, during right. my time at the bank. I became qualified, I became a, a chartered banker, these are things to <laughs> admit to. Uh, but very much specialised in providing financial advice to, to businesses, business owners, right. some corporates, charities, uh, and very much specialised in the pension world latterly. Uh, as as that time went on, so um, I've always been around it. In the last uh, eleven years, I've been self-employed in that space and various other things. So right. uh, I'm a business owner, uh, uh, a, a qualified individual, mm-hmm. um, and specialised into this uh, particular uh, area now. Yeah, and do you call it a product? Do you call it a solution? How do you, you know some uh, taps you in the show? What's this? He says you do SaaS. What's that? Uh, nobody What's knows. What's your bold uh, standard answer? Uh, um, <laughs> it's a it's a, it's a service with a product kind of sweet around it, if you like. So SAS is a, um, a, I suppose, an entitlement that HMRC give to a pension. Right. Um, so it's not an automatic right of passage, so it kind of has to qualify to get it. Uh-huh. Um, so it's, as a, you can call it whatever you like, but fundamentally, as long as you understand what it can do, then it yeah. won't really matter what it is. But, okay. um, but I probably a service, but okay. I don't mind what you call it, as long don't as it's mind. not rude. <laughs> as long as it's not rude, <laughs> of course. And I've heard you before, try and describe it, put a wee label on it as a 
business pension yeah. or a business pen- pension scheme. And I think the, the, the kind of intention behind that is you want to really show the clear differentiation between a personal pension scheme, yeah. something that a lot of people might be used to already. Is yeah. that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a, a personal pension is what most people are familiar with, which is the thing you typically have yourself or your employer may have given you access to it or funded it a bit for you yeah. uh, to an extent. Uh, a, a business pension or an occupational pension, to get more technical about it, is exactly right. what a SAS is. So a SAS is designed specifically for business owners, right? Uh, and it's designed to help those business owners essentially fund their pension in a better way. But at the same time, it helps their business all at the same time. Which is the whole same. point of this conversation. Yeah. Um, but the, the key thing there is it is for business owners. So it's not right. it's not a generic. It's not a retail product. It's not something you buy off the shelf. Yep. It's not a thing people are familiar with because it's not yeah. it's not commonplace. People would have it. Put into context, there's about fifty thousand SASs in the UK, right. and there will be fifty million pension arrangements wow. generally. So it's a very small part of it, but it's specialist uh-huh. and it's and it's it's a brilliant tool if. Uh-huh used in the right way for the right people. Have you seen it growing as well? Yeah. In the, in the kind of wider market? Is that a thing that's becoming yeah, more Yeah, definitely. So there's, yeah. Been, there's been more um, awareness of it, I guess. People have become, um, particularly in the property sector, actually, people yeah. see the value of it. You know, I've been massively busy with that in the last couple of years, which is great for us, and happy Excellent. to be more, obviously, with you guys. But um, that's where most people kind of click into the, the, the concept because they understand the, the, the ability to raise capital either from their own pension structures they've currently yeah. got they're maybe not doing very much uh-huh. um, or from other people's and they can work in a collaborative way with with like-minded professionals I guess so yeah it's definitely become more popular right okay dokie now we're just going to we'll jump into things we'll get the nitty gritties oh no you can't do that well the limitation is such and yeah. such so we can try and you know inform and well, educate as much a, as possible that's a good point actually because mm-hmm. on that, that a wee caveat around this uh-huh. um, that SAS is not for everyone yeah uh, and it most certainly isn't for um, promoted investment schemes and there's been some uh, questionable offerings come out in the last few years not right? so much in the SAS world but from old sort of fashion SIP type plans people try to promote schemes that if, if it, a pension comes with a promotion first right. it's usually not the right thing or maybe not the right thing for the end user the, the right. pension structure could, should come first and right. the investment comes after that it's secondary yeah so ah, something to be mindful of if you hear a promotion around that's maybe not the best way to okay you should it, so. set your spidey sense off yeah, fair so enough yeah. fair enough okay let break it into a wee kind of timeline here what I'm thinking is we could talk about the thing the mm-hmm. SAS and how to open it etc mm-hmm. then we can talk about how to fund it because it's something we can put money into as well yep. and then the real game changer it's how we can actually use it, yeah. you know, because that's where once when someone hears about it, you know, as a business owner, they're like, "Whoa, wait yeah. a minute, why have I not heard about this <laughs> yeah. before?" Yeah. With all the advantages and tax and so on, it's it's quite incredible. Yep. So the thing to to get a SAS, to open a SAS, yep. what is it we're doing, and who is it that's approving it for us and ticking the boxes yeah. and things? Good point. So the, the SAS itself is a, a generic structure so we as a SaaS provider I work with a SaaS provider if you say a company called yes. SaaS Co. So SaaS Co. Yep. Right. So we don't manufacture that SaaS we simply take your information so it's you personally and whoever else you want within the pension structure as individuals and members and your business which must be around that scheme to sponsor it and I'll come back to that uh, yep. l- later on. Yep. Um, so those bits of information are required to come to the provider right. and we then on your behalf apply for uh, a SaaS to be authorised by HMRC for its approval to be Those available are the guys. to be they're, used. They're yeah. going to be approving it. HMRC are by far the biggest determination of, um, of how SAS runs and the rules and the regulations around it. So they are the, the governor, if you like, yes. in, in this process. As ever. Indeed. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, not just this process, absolutely. So, um, so SAS is regulated. It's right. not regulated by the FCA who regulate retail products because this isn't a retail product. It's regulated by an entity called the Pension Regulator, imaginatively Ooh. named. Um, but they are massive. So Pension Regulator will govern all pension schemes, for example, all employer schemes like Royal Mail, RBS, Standard Life, ah, um, right, okay. huge, huge entities, civil service schemes. So th- it's, it's a massive entity, but you, they tend to inter- interact with retail users because it's not a retail uh, regulation process. Gotcha. Okay. And as you guide that application, what role do you fulfil? Are you an advisor? Are you an agent? You know, where, where yeah. do you kind of slot in there? Yeah. So there's a whole array of ways we can come at this. So if you're if you're process if you're intended use of SAS is fairly straightforward, then we can simply act as your 
um, trustee and administrator and take your application and and essentially guide it through the approval process for HMRC and then once right. it's approved we then will control that with you right. uh, or help you to work with the SAS and govern you in the rules and keep you essentially right with it. Uh -huh. If your circumstances are more complex and you have a, a more advanced situation we will bring in uh, your um, agreement of course uh, other professionals to, to advise on that SAS structure. That might be solicitors, it could be an IFA, right. it could be a surveyors, it could be a pensions um, so there could be all sorts of things that are required to actually do more with it than just the routine stuff. So in that can, sense, we would be an advisor, yep. uh, but we're not automatically having to be. So we're a facilitator predominantly in the, in the yes. first instance, and then we set it up and run it and keep you right thereafter. And you're advising on the process, aren't you? You're not like a financial advisor. I've heard you kind of stress this before yeah, as well. Yeah, it's a know, good to point. To keep that separation. Yeah, absolutely, and yeah. it's a very, very good point, and it is important just to make that very, very clear. So. If, if you were applying for a, a SIP or a personal pension, you'd absolutely do that through a regulated, an FC regulated um, financial advisor, usually right. an AFA. Um, this process is not a retail process and is not regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, right. um, which means that we as providers of that service do not be, are not regulated by the FC and don't have to be regulated by the FC sure. because there is no investment advice in the process. So we are simply applying for a structure and creating it and giving it to you. Right. Um, so that is important. So bear in mind, this is an occupational pension scheme. It's not the same as a personal scheme. So in essence, your business is applying for a pension, not you individually. That's right. There is that separation to think yeah. of. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And when we probably come to a few examples, we'll start to kind of clarify that. You yeah. can kind of walk through some case studies almost. Um, how much will it cost me to apply for it? Fortunes. And how long is it going to take? Fortunes ages, and ages. ages. Yeah. There you so go. So we'll just fun. end. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, the cost of certain scheme is not prohibitive and it's not, it's not a casual amount of money either. So typically the minimum charge would be £2,000 plus and depends on how many people are in the, in the, the SAS and people have around it and the complications that go with it. Yeah. But it's not it's not huge amounts of money, but it is not insignificant. So a couple of grand plus, yep. um, there are fees to run the SAS thereafter, which are in line with typical pension charges. Right. But on the basis, you can do an awful lot more with SAS than any other pension. Yes. The fees are generally relative to the value you'll get out of it. Gotcha. And you touched upon one more, we'll go for a tangent there because you're explaining it uh, depends who's involved in it. Yep. Because it's not just the case that I could own my SAS, I could also do it with a business partner. Correct. I could do it with a group of people. I could do it, I think you've heard, I've heard you speak about a, a family trust type yep. setup. There's a whole host of ways that this can be created, yeah. isn't there, for it's, different reasons. It's almost like we rehearsed this and, and I wish that it's we had. It's almost like that. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't. So, um, yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, maybe I should ask you your question. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so a SAS is, is a group pension structure. Right. Um, the definition of that is HMRC and their wisdom describe that um, limitation as less than 12 people can be part of a SAS. Right, that's good, there's a wee detail. Uh, which right. essentially means 11 people or less. Yep. Um, don't ask me why they define it that Less way. Than well. <laughs> um, go figure. It's um, the government. <laughs> indeed. So that that's fantastic. So if you have a, a board of directors or you have um, employees you want to bring into it, you can have up to 11 people within it. Typically though we see it as either co-directors um, and, and their spouses or partners or, or right. whatever, um, or typically a family business where it might be a, you know, two spouses or brothers, sisters, whatever relations it might want to be. Mm -hmm. The key thing with that is that everyone is their own distinct member of the SAS. Yes. And you mentioned the family trust thing. So over time, what that essentially means is that any wealth you create within the SAS will stay within it yeah. and that will cascade it down to whoever you nominate to be the beneficiary of that. And yes. if that's your family, that essentially is a tax-free inheritance they'll receive in their pension structure, which is unique to SAS. Yes, now there we go. We're already starting to touch upon this. Yeah. And wait a minute, this is a bit different. So I'm not going to jump ahead to how to use it and stuff. But yeah, so let's let's take the case study of a, a personal pension. Yep. You know, someone's working with the Royal Mail you picked up before, for example, and they've got their pension in their name. When they die, mm -hmm. what can happen there that doesn't happen? Yeah, What's so so in essence, whilst a pension structure is generally regarded as tax free in, in its existence, and in, in the event of death, then that will at some point or form part of you know, a calculation in, in your estate. Now, it may estate. it may remain tax free, depends if it's in payment or there's all sorts of complications around that. I'm not going to give advice on that specific sure. so not here. However, um, with SAS, 
none of that will apply because mm -hmm. the money doesn't leave the environment of the SAS. Yeah. And if you nominated someone in your family to benefit from that, the money will stay within it and it's simply your name's rubbed out and their name's penciled in. Um, or is already in it anyway. Yes. Um, so it's quite a it's a very straightforward process, but um, again this is the distinction between being FCA regulated and not. So we, we won't yeah. guide on what you currently have only on what you currently plan to have with the SAS. Gotcha, gotcha. There'll be a few business owners already thinking, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, tax benefits, <laughs> legacy benefits, yeah. my family, oh, hold on, they'll be, they'll be sitting up in their seats already. Yeah. And that, that's exactly what this kind of thing does, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Length of time, how long will it take to go through an HMRC to give us a thumbs yeah. up? Yeah, so each expectations. HMRC will take as long as they take to, yeah. to handle that process. And I do not mean that cynically. If I look cynical, that's just because I'm experienced. <laughs> In the process, sometimes um, these can take you know a couple of weeks, two or three weeks. Sometimes I've had it up to 12, 13 months, wow. um, and there's no real sort of rationale between or why. Um, HMRC have changed their systems and processes recently, and that time scale has um, dramatically decreased again. So I don't see a problem with it. It's just we need to be aware that no one other than HMRC have the ability to determine yes. uh, or flow that process. So that's the bottleneck uh, we're yeah, making on Just right. a slight caveat on that as well. Yeah, so manage expectations. Yep. That's one thing. Um, for opening it up, it's true to say that if I was successful, got a SAS opened, that could be the end of the story. If I was so so inclined, not use it, not put any money, it's just a thing. Yeah. Now that's a bit daft, but just to start to you know build yeah. that picture, that's, you could have a SAS and it, it's got nothing in it, doesn't do anything, etc. That's Correct. just the first part of the puzzle, isn't it? Yeah, so there's no compulsion to use it and you can yeah. have that if you want to. You might come back to it for a particular project and I'm not against specifics. You, yeah. might, you might have identified a, a, an investment, you know, commercial property, for example, or land, for example, mm -hmm. that you want to do and that's maybe going to take six months, ten months, a year beyond where you currently are, but you need the SAS to to fulfil that yeah. requirement. So you might have it for that reason in advance. But yeah, there's no no one's gonna to say to you you need to do this or the other with it. It's entirely up to you what you do with it. Yeah. And and from that purpose it is just a, a trust that you own it's in your business name and yeah. and you you know do with it what you will. Perfect. So finishing off this phase of applying and getting the ball rolling, what is it I need to know for myself to think, oh yeah, I qualify for this. I should do this. As a, as a person, as a business, etc. What's my, my requirements at the very start then? Yeah, so the, because it's a business owner's pension scheme, then yep. logically the pension is only available to people who own a business, and that would typically be a limited company or um, a limited liability partnership or a Scottish partnership, not in the sense of uh, Russian tax evasion. Scottish <laughs> partnership as a traditional partnership that happens to be based in Scotland. Yep. Um, so traders can apply if they then have or create a, a, a limited company or liability. Right. Um, but there needs to be justification that have actually been in business. The point, the fundamental point of it is HMRC do not want to see application for people who have just set up a new business with no experience today and apply for a SAS today or tomorrow. Yeah. Um, because that, that will ring alarm bells with them assuming that there's some investment scheme around that exactly. that they've been kind of funneled into a channel to, uh, to fulfil and that's not what they want to see. So yeah. genuine business owners with various structures, we can talk them through how that works, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a fairly simple qualification. Right, perfect. So we've got the box opened, now we want to fill the box up. There's different ways we can fund this thing, isn't there? Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I, I can essentially just put money in, contributions would be classed as, yeah? Yep, can absolutely. do it that way? Yeah. So th th there are a variety of ways. So typically people will consider what existing pensions they've got. Yes, um, elsewhere. Correct, mm -hmm. and, and that's entirely their own um, preference. They can do that or not do that. They can take advice to do it or otherwise that's entirely up to them. We'll happily accept that value into the pension scheme for them. Uh -huh. um, so, and people usually identify they've got a lot of value in there they perhaps didn't think that they had. Exactly. I and mean, many people just don't have a clue what is in their pensions. And why know? would you, to be honest, it's not a thing yeah. you think about until probably too late. That's um, it. And, and most people are, are usually, not always, but usually pleasantly surprised what they've got in their pension scheme. Yeah. If it's been a, an employer scheme, for example, they, did, they wouldn't know the value of it because they're working on a sort of final salary basis. So that's one way and that's entirely up to the um, the the member. Mm -hmm. uh, they can also fund value straight from their business, so if they have a profit they can contribute up to half a million pounds per annum, right? Uh, oh. which is massively more than you can for personal pension. So exactly, because we sips in it, what is it, 40 grand? Correct, or, yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah. So all personal pension, 40 grand. You, right. There's things you can do to bring more of that forward, but that's another story. Sure. Um, so half a million pounds per annum can go from your business to a SaaS, that's entirely tax allowable. And in certain cases, that can be up to two million pounds in one go if you have, see, sold a business or a building or you had a lot of value there. So you can right. um, do things and spend the relief over, over three years. Uh -huh. um, or you can just make a contribution into the thing on a monthly basis. You can put personal money into it. 
You can also contribute existing assets. So if you had existing commercial premises that you owned, you can contribute them into the SAS as a whole well. subject around that, right. as well as existing land or other investments that you can have, you can put it into the SAS directly. That's um, massively tax efficient, and again, for a, a more detailed discussion. Yes, so loads of different options there to play with. If yep. I'm a successful business owner with a certain amount of income just constantly churning, as you say, I can set up a monthly thing. Actually, I'm just going to tidy that away yep. into this SAS thing. I'm getting all these tax benefits and it's building up. It's becoming this pot that we can use yep. when we get to uh, section number three. Uh, can I just put money in here, there and everywhere? Obviously, with the limitations on it, it doesn't have to be monthly no. or have to be a yearly thing. No, yeah, so, so that's wide open. Yeah, absolutely. The key thing with SAS is that the, the definition that's used is a SAS is a member of directed pension scheme that just goes oh, off look the it's so it? easy just like as if you've been in this game wait, for ages wait till you tell your pals out <laughs> um, but the key with that is you decide so you're the member you're the company owner you decide how and when and if you use it or don't or contribute or don't or borrow money back out of it and yeah. again another subject we'll discuss but, yep. but it's you to decide there's no one overseeing that apart from you and maybe it's a good point actually to kind of come back on right so Traditionally, with all pensions, there are three distinct parts of a pension. There's the bit that um, essentially is the trust, that is a structure that is the, the, the rules, if you like, around the, the, the pension itself. Mm -hmm. There's an administration function, which obviously does the pushing the paper about. Yeah. And there's an investment part of it, which obviously invests the money in, 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 on your behalf, usually. Yeah. Within a SAS, we have three parts, but we as the administrator do not control the investment part that is entirely down to you. That's you. Uh, and yeah. it's quite an important yeah. distinction to get in mind. People often ask me have, after these presentations, well, what's the risk with the money? And well, whatever you oh. choose it to be. <laughs> Don't ask me, pal. Uh, okay, that will, yeah. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. That's exactly <laughs> the answer I'm going to give back. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so the, the control of it is entirely down to the member and the, and the company. That's really your money. You do with right. it what you will, provided we will act in that process as essentially referee and, and the rule checker to make sure you're not going beyond the rules or out with of because course. that's what our function is. Yes. So it's totally flexible, but you do with it what you will. And that can be into anything mainstream or anything that's allowable, yeah. but it's your decision. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Now, to keep that running then, so we've got it, we've popped some money in it as well, maybe we've done these, in fact, let's, let's finish off with the transfers of pensions. Mm -hmm. uh, people can have one corporate pension through their life, they get one kind of business pension, they've uh, maybe get multiple, some are deferred, some are frozen because they changed job, they true paid, whatever. Yep. The process of getting the, those moved over to a SAS we need to tie in with other people, we need to tie in with IFAs on some occasions yeah. and let them guide that part of the puzzle for us. Yeah, potentially. Yep. It's not mandatory you have to do that. So, yep. However, what is mandatory, if you have a, an employer scheme or a final salary scheme, um, then you must have financial advice on that, that process simply because um, that's that's a lot. So you have to have yep. had advice to transfer it of an existing scheme such as that. Yep. If, however, you have straightforward personal pensions and you are comfortable as the owner of that scheme that you want to otherwise change how its investors are structured, you can direct your SAS trustee uh -huh. to transfer that money in your behalf. Right. However, in all cases, I would suggest getting independent financial advice is always useful. Of course. Uh, because at least I'll identify what you might not understand about that process. Exactly. Now, is that where the, the kind of, not a limitation as such, but a, a wee cap on it around the £30,000 mark? The, the IFAs would cross check one that's above it or yeah. below it type thing, keep you, us right there. You've been reading up, haven't I've you? been reading up on this. Absolutely. So there is a, a, a qualification, <coughs> £30,000 of an occupational scheme is a point at which you must have had advice beyond it. If it's less than that, you don't have to have had it. Right. But again, if it's probably like you can have two or three, maybe more, um, pots of money in different structures. It'd just be wise to get independent advice. You're not obliged to do it. But why wouldn't you do it? So exactly. it's, it's not a, a light decision, so you better to just no, double correct. check that you're comfortable yeah, with it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah. And to keep it going, are we still paying? Is there a maintenance charge, an administration? How yeah. does that work yeah. cost wise? So we know about that as a business owner. Remember, I mentioned the fortunes a bit before. This so, is where the fortunes uh, come so, in. Brace so yourselves. That, that continues. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so there is, there is indeed, there are indeed charges ongoing. So that's for the control, the management, the administration, the the reporting, the compliance with the regulator in HMRC. That's what the, you've paid the trustee that's for. That's for. Yep. So I represent the trustee. I'm not the trustee, obviously, directly. So they will charge an annual fee based on the number of people you have within the SAS. Right. Um, so typically for two people, the charge would be in the order of £500 per person. Right. If it's three people, it's approximately £400 per person. And the higher you go, the less it comes per, right. per individual. Right. Now, discount. correct. And on the basis that a typical SIP will charge between probably three and £600 per annum. And again, there are 
various charges around that, and I'm not yes. saying that's what it definitely is, but that's what typically would be a SAS looks like good value, particularly there are more people in it, yeah. and particularly because it can do way more than any other sort of can yeah, exactly. achieve for you, and it works in tandem with your business. Right, exactly. So it's costing us money to set it up, it's costing us money to keep it going. Yep. Why on earth would I do this kind of thing? Well, this is where the fun comes. <laughs> Part number three, yep. what you can actually do with it. So. With that, that, those funds, that SaaS, at my disposal as a business owner, I can start to think about different ways to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll, we'll make sure we've got, oh well, there's a wee limitation in that area and you need to remember such and such. We'll make sure we pick up all the wee loose ends and stuff. Mm -hmm. But theoretically, I could buy something. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I was daft enough to buy something that I was going to enjoy, buy something such as a Ferrari or a yacht, <laughs> The tax man's going to come back to me, isn't he? Yeah. All well, tax benefits are gone indeed. off the table. Yeah. We can't well, be daft with this, can't we not? No. So the tax man <laughs> being the tax man is... Uh, I guess the view of that, the tax man's been there and done it before you and I have thought about it. Yeah, and that's really how to just sort of <laughs> be quite logical about it. So I, I ask these questions more or less every day, if not every week. Um, can I buy that car? Can I buy that flat? Can I buy sales accommodation? Can I, all these things. I'm, I'm, I'm not dismissing that as irrelevant questions, but... Sure. Um, in simple fact, you cannot have an asset in a pension scheme that, in essence, you can enjoy. Mm -hmm. That's one definition of it, i.e. a car. Yeah. Um, so that may have a, an investment value. You know, have I those, I've heard all these arguments before, well, uh, and I've, I would agree with them, yeah. uh, but you still can't do it. So that's a nice discussion, but forget it. Yeah. Uh, with, with residential property, there is no pension scheme in the UK that can buy, purchase, or invest in directly, directly. to yep. own uh, residential property in a pension scheme, you can't do it. Yep, so that's I'll, I'll maybe table slightly that explain way. that. You can do it, mm -hmm. however, uh, HMRC will charge your pension 55% of the value of Ouch. it in so doing. So unless you buy it at more than 55% discount, Don't why would you there. be bothering? Yes. Uh, and you just wouldn't, and we would not encourage that, we can't encourage that, we wouldn't allow it uh, as a trustee. So you cannot do it. Yep. Principal reason is, if you think of it as logical again, HMRC give us all benefits, tax benefits of putting money into a pension yes. and there's a timeline up before which you cannot access it, mm -hmm. which is 55 and beyond. Yep. So if you look to, to take value from it or invest in a structure that you can use or benefit from in that process before 55, they regard that as inappropriate and it's against regulations, you just can't do it. You just can't do it. Yep. Right. Like it. Okay. The, the not directly residential, we'll come to that wee yep. puzzle a wee bit later on, but let's play with some of the simpler stuff and it's a great example of how you can use it, we could buy commercial. Yeah, we absolutely. could buy commercial property with this. 100% allowable. 100%, yes. Yeah, yeah, one of the main reasons why a lot of people will use a SaaS. Um, so an absolute fact, yes, a SaaS can purchase commercial property directly. It can right. own it directly. There's no need to um, have gone through third parties or, it's, it's, that's, or loans. They, they just use the money in the pension scheme to buy the asset that is a whatever that may be, a retail or commercial, industrial, Something, whatever. Yep, yep. Um, it can also buy land or development land, it can develop land and all sorts of clever things. But yes, it can purchase commercial property directly and either lease it to a third party. Right, so that can be done as well. Correct. Uh, interesting. Or occupying those premises within their own with their own business. Right. Um, so in that sense, you become the landlord and the tenant all in the one structure. Gotcha. Um, but it's the same people that are running both shows with different representations, but that's exactly how it works. Right. And that can be hugely efficient for some businesses to want, want to keep a control of it, but also taking the benefit of having the asset within yeah, your pension exactly. scheme tax free. Yeah, tax free, there's that word again. Yep, All the like ears that. prick up. Yep. Business owners love hearing that kind <laughs> of thing. <laughs> uh, and again, it will be ears will be pricking up because the, the people will be th thinking to themselves, wait a minute, I can actually tap into this. I've got this great commercial opportunity. I've been in, uh, buying commercial stuff for a long time now. I know what I'm doing. I know when a deal is a deal, but I've ran out. I've got to the end and I've got these pensions sitting here or I've got you know, profits for the business that I'm getting heavily taxed on and stuff. Yeah. And I've just not had a, a way to live that to use that, yep. this can be a solution for it. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. And, and, and you touched upon the well. land thing as well, so yeah. new build, land developments, again, it's a, a direct tap yeah. into so that thing. Uh, land is, a, is an allowable investment within a SAS, right. uh, as with any um, occupational scheme, so what that allows you to do is, is to purchase land at whatever value that may currently be, change the use of it, change the consent, plan consent on it, and make a gain in it. That is simply an investment as far as the SAS is concerned, right. and that could be significant. So you could buy a piece of agricultural land at five grand an acre, mm -hmm. and go through the process of gaining planning consent on it, which the SAS can also pay for because it owns the site, right. um, and change the value of that to two, three, four, five hundred thousand pounds per acre. 
for example, no, not, I'm just talking about the sky, but these are, these are a good not, deal. <laughs> it does not <laughs> unrealistic figures, and that, that can and will happen. It might take you two, three years, it might take you yes. whatever period that takes. However, that gain, so that uplift that you make to then sell the site to whoever that may be, could be yourself, your own business, or a third party, that mm-hmm. gain will sit within your SaaS, again, free of tax, because it's been moved within a tax-free environment, gotcha. which is phenomenal for some people. Yes. Now, you, you could, as I said, your business could purchase that land from your SaaS, and you could develop the site and make a, a, a profit on the trading of that development, if you like. Right. And then, bizarrely, use a profit you've made within that development to put back into the SaaS as well to reduce tax on your business or save all tax on your business. Yep. And um, these are fairly complex, but not out with the normal routine of people use the SaaS for. And yeah. I'm happy to discuss that with anyone who's got an aspiration to do so. Of course. And does the the limitation or the cap around the five hundred thousand per year that does that still operate when we're dealing with turning around a land deal, for example, and we've got a massive uplift in it? Can, can I put everything back in or is it still no 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 you've, you've done as much as you can this year pal yeah. is it still in just, operation just kind of two points here so if, if the asset is already within the SaaS mm-hmm. it can make any gain that it chooses to make because wow. that's that's already in the SaaS that's not a contribution limit so the half a million limit you mentioned is a contribution limit how much you can put into it per annum right um, now that's generally £500,000 and you'll get full tax relief on that money going from your business yep if however that so come back to that example if that trading of that development had made you two million pounds or more, yep. or, or within two million pounds I should say, then you can you can put all of that again into the SAS now. Right. HMRC will allow you to spread that tax relief over three years. Essentially ah, that's six hundred and sixty right. seven, whatever it is, uh-huh. per annum of relief. It's higher than half a million. Right. Uh, but you can get the money based out of your business into the safe environment, the tax free environment of the SAS. Yes. Uh, and that's again hugely important for some people. Fantastic, and I mean, there's loads of guys and girls who've through a protege, through platinum training, and you are dealing with this. You are dealing with commercial opportunities. You are dealing with land development deals, and you know, working with the likes of Paul and uh, working on these things. It will take a bit of time. Time-wise, if I do it this way, if I'm buying commercial, buying the land, any limitations, anything I should be afraid of? Oh no, you need to have all of that done and dusted within two and a half years or something. <laughs> no, you know? nothing. No, yep. and the process of acquiring or selling exactly the same. It's just that the owner of the the site is a SAS mm-hmm. uh, and there may be one or two more signatures required on it because sure. there's you and the trustee but there's not it's not an inordinate amount of time to, to do it or time limits or issues or anything around that it's just a, a, a buy and a sale right now the residential part again going to come on to next what if I buy commercial mm-hmm. but I bought it with a purchase of converting it into residential mm-hmm. am I handcuffing myself there is that still possible yeah absolutely so yep. th- th- it's possible with an understanding of what has to happen at the end at of the that end process of so the SAS can buy resi property and it can pay for the development or the refurbishment of that into it can buy the commercial property commercial property ah, um, and it can convert that into r- resi yeah, property yep. Um, it just cannot own that resi property in a right. fully completed habitable state. And this is an HMRC definition. Right. So coming back to the point made before, so a SAS cannot own residential property. If it yep. does, it'll pay 55% tax on yep. the value of that property. What it can do, though, is own a resi property that is not habitable. Right. It wouldn't seek to go and buy that, but it can, by default, have created that within the SAS. Okay. And provided the definition of that means that the property cannot be connected to wastewater i.e. drainage, <laughs> right. um, or fresh water, i.e. <laughs> Turning those taps <laughs> Exactly. Yep. Now, so if they're not connected, the property could be fully furnished, could be the lights are on, the TV on, the whole, you know, shouldn't match. It just cannot have water in and out. Wow. Of it. That is, if it is connected, it is habitable. If it isn't, it's uninhabitable. Right. And if it's uninhabitable, it's asking owners. So what the SAS would have to do is have sold those properties either off plan or to right. another entity or refinanced it to the, their own company to then opt for so it could be a simple bridge could have facilitate that but um, right okay okay so we've t- we've used it to to purchase the opportunity to convert the opportunity but then when we are disposing of it we've got to make sure we do it properly correct yeah. and there's a whole process around that which we can happily guide you through right. but it can be done absolutely can be done, yeah. yeah fantastic and when it comes so let, let's follow that between i thought then so if i buy it commercial it's in the sas uh, we do it up, get it all nicely converted, uh, get it to the point where it is going to be habitable and sold. And let's say, for example, I sell it into or pass it on to the business outside mm-hmm. of the SAS. Yep. Uh, income and stuff from that, I can throw that back into yeah, the SAS. Absolutely. Yeah. So the SAS is by no means out of the game at that yeah, point. It's exactly. just that you've, you've 
transfer the asset from the ownership of the SaaS to your business mm -hmm. and mean a gain on it, you'd presume, mm -hmm. or income from it, both of which can go back into the SaaS because the business is connected to your SaaS. Because it's connected, yeah. yes. Tax man still kept yeah. it, mate. Uh, well, oh, you're and like a superhero. <laughs> 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 uh, and I should say, it's, it's worth a point on that actually. Yes. There is nothing in any of these sorts we're talking about that is remotely regarded as tax avoidance no. or they have to declare as tax avoidance. These are routine HMRC pension rules that, that are legislated for. They are written down, they're clear, there is no issue with it or test yeah. on it. SAS has been around for 40 years. Which is surprising, isn't it? For a name that's hardly known. Correct. It's quite uh, incredible. It has tended to be a bit of a, a, a sort of restricted club because people, once they have that knowledge, tend to have kept it to themselves because they're <laughs> sort of making. Uh oh, uh, yeah, no, not anymore. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm happy to share the news. You're happy to share the news. Absolutely. The uh, but people have tended just generally not to have shared that information. Accountants don't really understand SAS particularly well. Yes. IFAs understand it, but it's kind of a wee bit off the reservation for them. It's not a routine product, so they tend not to have been focused on it. Sure. Um, I should say as an IFA I was very focused on it but there's, al there's always exceptions to the rule. different breed. Absolutely. <laughs> Many folk would agree with you. Um, but yeah so you can you can you can sort these things really cleverly but you just need to be careful of the rules and regulations but we can guide you through them. Yes exactly. Perfect. Right so there's buying and loads of opportunities there. People will be wide awake now thinking my goodness I definitely can't do that over my, my existing pension world. We can also lend you know, we can lend out to other things. Yep. But there's, again, always you know, structure, limitations, things yeah, to absolutely. bear in mind. So we can lend out to our own business. Yep. Yes, yep. this is going so to be possible. There are two types of lending the SAS can right. make, and we'll cover that one first. So if the first type is what's called a loan back, and that loan is back to your own business, which is a sponsoring right. business of your own pension so scheme. That, that's a good point. So sponsoring business, this is how I think of these boxes, isn't it? I've got yep. my SAS here, this is my business, my limited company, that's the sponsoring business and it's got a connection. Correct. Yep, right, that, cool. that just, for, again, for clarity, doesn't give the business any liability or risk of the pension. Ultimately, no. it's just connecting the two so that the business can lend, sorry, the business can contribute to the SAS yep. and the SAS can lend to the business. It's just a, a, it's a connection between them, an understanding, yes. if you like. Cool. So carry on, so yeah. loan back. So in the loan back, you are allowed to take up to 50% of the net value of your SAS, whatever right. that may be. So assuming your SAS is worth £200,000 for simplicity, you can lend £100,000 of that back to your own business. Right. Now, that for many people is information enough, quite frankly, to exactly. then think, well, I need to know more about this because that for simplicity is capital back to your business that you can use within your business for any purpose that is so connected to your yep. trade um, and that can, well, we can discuss the detail of that in a bit more depth right. but that's in generic what it is there are rules around that mm -hmm. and simply because HMRC being HMRC and they're, they're not incorrect in this assumption need to protect essentially you from you yes. um, so they want to make sure there are rules that prohibit you or restrict you from taking a hundred grand out and thinking Oh, remember that Ferrari that I spoke about, here's what I'm going to do with that. Um, <laughs> and here's, I actually make quite a long holiday and they'll come back. And I've had all these questions, people get oh, a, bit, a bit imaginative with it, shall we say. <laughs> um, so what they, they must see is a, a maximum five year term of repaying that loan, and it right. is a loan. Uh, and it must be repayable by capital and interest on a monthly basis right. over that five year period. Uh -huh. And it must also be secured against uh, an unencumbered asset. Right, um, perfect. So here's all the, wee all the wee boxes we need to make sure we tick. Yeah, right. and for some people that can be a challenge because, and we've had a conversation about that quite recently where yeah. you might have a whole launch bunch of asset value but there's debt against it. Yes. And that, while some might be hundreds of thousands of miles of equity in there, you can't actually use it. Yeah not as cleanly as you might like anyway. Um, there are ways and means around that, but it's just something to bear in mind. So in simple terms, it's a loan, you need to repay over five years, you're yep. paying a capital repayment and it must be secured. And you mentioned capital and interest. Mm -hmm. Where does the interest number come up from? Uh, who, who decides that? My word, you have been reading up. <laughs> <laughs> this is my line, is it? Uh, <laughs> over <laughs> my straight man. Helpful glue. Um, yeah, so as we said before, uh, no, uh, so it is a, it's a good point. So there is a loan, so there's an interest charge on it. HMRC is the overseer of that process. You yep. need to see that you have a commercial arrangement in place there. So what you cannot do is your SAS can't lend you your own business that money at 0% because yeah. that obviously is not sensible for the SAS. Why would it invest in something giving you no return? Yeah. And likewise, um, 
the SAS, or you cannot have an interest rate where you're repaying 25% a week. Uh, are some payday lenders. Wonga. <laughs> a Wonga SAS. Who the, knows where they come? Are, there are other payday there lenders. Are other pay- uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for mentioning one that we all know. Um, but yeah, so that would be not commercial for the business yeah. and, and, and just really not in tune with normal commerciality. So typically yeah. we see interest rates of around and about 3% to around about 9% or more. Right. That's not a limit, there's no restriction on that, but there must be at least a commercial interest rate applicable to it. Uh, right. And that's for discussion when we get down to the detail of that. Yeah, and is there any benefit in choosing lower, higher, when it comes to that number? It, I guess it depends on the purpose of, of the loan. So, the loan itself. Um, and again, we'll put a, a sort of caveat in here that if, if anyone's considering using this for a buy to let process, it will not work because yeah. You're essentially, well, unless you've got a flat 10,000 quid or something, but you're essentially, and I'm not recommending that, but, no. <laughs> uh, but you're essentially trying to fund a long term purchase with a five year loan, yeah. and that generally for cash flow will not work. Yep. Um, it could, but I would not advocate doing that, and it's not really you know, something you want to be very careful of doing it. Yeah. Um, so the interest rate really is just if whatever suits the model that you're working with, whatever suits the cash flow. But you, but a thing to bear in mind here is, as an individual, you are representing your pension, which you want to make money, yes. and your business, which you want to do the same. So there's kind of a, an equilibrium you'll get to, which is probably about 5%, right. typically for people, because it's a fair return for the pension, and it's not an exorbitant rate of money uh, to spend on lending or borrow money uh, to help your business. Uh-huh. And if I've used that loan to successfully grow, expand my business, and getting loads of profit from it. I'm paying back that 5%, I'm paying back the capital and everything's going nicely and the loan will get repaid. But there's even more, pro- I've done so well with it, it's fantastic. I can still think about contributions back to that size. Absolutely. Yeah, and get yeah. away from that tax yeah. man again. As a virtuous, absolutely, as a virtuous cycle. And again, that's all perfectly legitimate and simple yeah. um, tax and pension planning. So if that loan and, and it should be for the benefit of the business. And that would helps the business to do whatever that may be, yep. to generate profit or more gain or grow the business, whatever, which is all the same thing ultimately. Mm-hmm. Whatever gain that makes, you can choose to put that or part of it or all of it into the SaaS if you want, mm-hmm. whenever you want to do that. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Excellent. So I've got my SaaS, I can lend to my business yep. and grow that. Doesn't even have to be property, you know, any business. That's what Correct. these guys are listening from, they come from all sorts of backgrounds. But I can also lend it to other businesses yeah. and other people. So if you've got a business and I want to lend to you because I see it as an investment, I'm going to get a good return before my commercial relationship, yep. that's possible as well. Yeah, yeah. and th- this this part, which is um, called third party or unconnected loan, that just, again, was off the tongue, oh, doesn't it? Just like that. Uh, th- this bit is hugely popular, particularly for people who are involved in property, commercial property and, and sort of land development, where they understand that access to capital is the key thing. Yeah. Because what you're obviously trading in is assets of significant cost and value that need significant capital to uh, to facilitate that. So by having the ability to lend to third parties, so for example, uh, in a sense that you had or have, you will inevitably know people who are in a similar business to yourself, mm-hmm. but maybe you can't fund that project yourself, however you'd rather help someone else to do it, yeah. and essentially, it's not a bridging facility, but essentially that's what it, it looks not yeah. similar to. So if you could lend £100,000 of your money, to, or your SaaS money, sorry, to a third party business for them to undertake that project, that will pay your SaaS back a return that you set, right. typically more than you would charge your own business. Is it, right, it's different numbers. Just because it's more commercial and it's an yeah. investment, and there's a bit of risk involved in it, sure. um, but that could be managed. So you might charge, I don't know, 8, 10, 12% in that process. Right. For the person borrowing the money, that's a much easier and cleaner process to borrow it from you as someone they know, albeit yeah. through a, a structure. Um, there are less charges, less fees, and, and it's a quicker process. Yeah. And it's probably more friendly, mm-hmm. assuming it all goes right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, and it's, you know, it can be done for any period you wish. Right. And that's so important. So those limitations it, you spoke about when I was lending to myself, they start to change a bit. Correct. Yeah, so right. the, the limitation to lend to your own business is governed because HMRC are nervous about what you might do with the money. But yeah. it's a third party structure. That is just an investment to a third party business. Yeah. Just as you could invest into Standard Life or Aviva or Scottish Widows and there are other fund managers, but yeah, all that. So you could put money into that. Yep. There's no guarantee you get anything back out of that or a guarantee of any return. True. This is the same in essence. Although as trustee of your pension, we would typically guide you to want to secure that loan because lending £100,000 to someone is not insignificant yes. and you might want to see some recourse on it. 
particularly if you're investing in property, and that can be quite easily done because there's an asset around about that that would help them yeah. uh, to secure it or other things. But that, again, that's, that's a much more flexible process than security, repayment timescales, interest rates, all that sort of stuff. So uh-huh. in this space that we're talking about, that is hugely popular. I'll bet it is, yeah, a massive eye-opener for people in the property yep. world. Again, S- I, I'm one for caveats here to become yes, go conscious for that we so what you cannot do though, HMRC will not allow me to lend you hundred grand and you let me hundred grand back because that is illegal. Right, yes, crossing over Correct. with each other. They yep. regard that yep. as what's called a buddy loan and you cannot do that. I then get asked the question, what first three, four or five us doing it? Well, it means there's three, four or five, you break buddies. the law. Um, so <laughs> uh, you can't You just do got it. a lot of buddies. <laughs> you Correct. still can't do it. <laughs> cannot do it. And <laughs> so it's good just to stamp these wee questions. Like people will always ask that. And it's not a bad yeah. thing to be creative with imagination, but... No, exactly. It, it, yeah, just to see what's possible. Exactly. Is this allowed? No, no, okay. Is this an option? Uh, well, if you change it such and such a way, you can do it that Precisely. way. Precisely. Yeah. So, so we as a trustee will always act within the rules 100% right. of the time. Right. Um, and there may be questions that come all around that, but we'll never go beyond what the, the regulations state. Right. Uh, those regulations are massively helpful. There's yeah. no need to go beyond them, quite frankly, as no, long as exactly. you understand how it works. So, yeah. yeah, and there's already so much freedom there for you anyway. Precisely. You know, you don't even have to look for more almost. That's it. When each project happens, okay, I'm going to take 50 grand and invest it in my, uh, sorry, loan back to my business. I'm going to take this 50 grand and I'm going to invest it in that third party. Is that a long process? Is it a costly process? Or is it individually priced? Or it's all covered with a monthly fee. How does that work? Remember, I said the fortunes, but the fortunes so again. That more fortunes. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to regret ever saying that. I guess, but three times is probably too much. Um, so yeah, there is a, a an, an admin charge around creating loans. A bit of documentation around that you might imagine right. a bit back and forward. Um, if, however, you've created a loan six months ago and you want to do another one this month and one after then we can negotiate on the fees around that. It's not these right. are hundreds of pounds, not thousands of pounds to do these things. But right. there is a, a set tariff and we can share that with you. Sure. Uh, and we would share it with anyone anyway who has a SAS. But um, it's not a huge amount of money, particularly not given what you're trying to achieve out of it. Exactly, the end result. Plus in that process, you if you're lending third party to mm-hmm. an external business, you you can your SAS can charge fees right. to that business that can cover any fees you're paying or quite commonly the third party would just pay your fees. And right, they would just cover them. Yeah, and that's absolutely fine. Okay, okay. So these third parties, there's, there's obviously scope there that does bring in residential property mm-hmm. because we're doing something or we can do something indirectly. Is mm-hmm. that the way we should consider that? Yeah, so if, as long as property is the nature of the business that is... That the third party does. Uh-huh, correct. Yeah, then right, that, right. That's acceptable because yep. that's not anything to do with your SaaS per se. Your, your SaaS is lending money to a third party business. Uh-huh. Where it's your own SaaS and your own loan, then if, as long as your business is a property business and lending into property structure is not inappropriate. Right, gotcha. Um, again, we can discuss that in much, much more depth, but yeah. um, there are loads of things you can do with property and land and development that you just need to be very clear on what they are. Uh-huh. Yeah, and it's probably not for right at this minute because there's quite a lot of stuff to, to discuss around the depth of that. Right, okay, okay. The 55, the mm-hmm. age 55. So yep. over here in my personal pension world, I've got this wee cute thing. Once I hit that benchmark, I can take 25% tax free. Yep. Can SAS do that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, so rules and regulations around what are called at that stage crystallising benefits. Oh, that's another one. Take a note. Just nailed it. <laughs> uh, just like that. SAS bingo. Just try and spell it. <laughs> um, taking the money out, I think it's how we generally regard it. Um, at that point, those rules are generic along, amongst all pensions in the UK. And those rules were changed a few years ago where you can actually take a lot more of that value back out of your scheme right. at 55 and you just brought down to 55. However, there are tax consequences of doing all of that, but the flexibility is built into it. SAS is no different and, and actually it has, does have some more options in terms of how you can access that more efficiently. Right. For example, within your SAS, you may at point 55, each 55, have money still invested in commercial property. You don't have to resell that and, and, and reshape the money to get money back out of it. Right. Right, there's some cash in the SAS, of course, that can help you take some tax-free money out. Uh-huh. And you have to rearrange that. You can still have the same family members in the SAS. You can still have the same structure, same income stream going into it. Right. Um, but you have the option, 55, to take up to 25% of the value of the SAS at that time out as tax-free money, right. essentially. You can take all of it out, but uh-huh. you'll pay 75 That's, tax yeah, sorry, once at once at 9% of the money at your um, marginal rate of tax. But there's a process within SAS that allows you to, to manage how you take it out. You might not take anything out right. until you're 70 or 63 or whatever that's entitled yeah. to you. And even when you do start to take it out, you can manage how much of it you do take. So you might imagine at 55, 
your value might be half a million quid. Mm -hmm. It's 65, it might be 800,000 pounds. So naturally 25% of that is a lot higher. Yeah. And that's up to you how you take it out. Um, you may take 2% of your tax free cash now or mm -hmm. not. You might, it's it tied up to you manage, you might take out 3% for eight years or 2% for 12 and a half. Gotcha. There's all these ways of doing it. So there's not a prescribed way that you must do it. Aye. The flexibility is back to you. Right. How does that work from the point of view if, it's, if it is a group, if it's a family trust? You know, so two people turn 55. Yep. And, you know, how does the pie get split? Yeah, in that so the, that, the, the, the allocation has already been done throughout the process. So whoever right. put money in, the, the SAS will, or the company, as you say, will nominate who that money is for. So right. like, we may be co directors and we might put 100 grand in, but because you want harder than me this year, you're getting 60 grand, I'm getting 40. Right. That will allocate accordingly. Any investment return that makes will be proportionate to whatever was put in at the start. So each person is. Pot. I don't like using that one, but that's no, really what I know, it is. I know. It is allocated individually for the individual, mm -hmm. and when it comes to retirement or taking crystallisation, then that value is already calculated as your value that you can draw from. But that won't affect other people uh, in the mix. Brilliant stuff. It's quite a thing, isn't it? Yeah. It, it is quite a solution. It, most people have never heard of it. Yeah. Um, and that's understandable given it's not a retail product, yeah. and most professionals have not really sort of promoted it in that sense. Um, when people understand it, they'll, they'll always find a way that suits them, their business, you know, yeah. to, 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 to use it. Whether it's for you know, putting large amounts of profit into it, they can't do it into personal pension, whether it's about using the thing for existing assets, whether it's about protecting money from their pension out with, sorry, from their business into a pension, because taking money out of their business, obviously putting it somewhere else, protects that from any risk the business might have. Yeah. And that, for some people, that's a huge thing, but they might have been insolvent before a problem with their business, getting money out of a business is a big, big thing. Yeah. And a SAS is a great, simple, legitimate way of doing that within all the pension and, and each of our serials. It might be because you want to borrow money back out or lend money to third parties. There's all sorts of reasons to create a family trust and yeah. avoid the health and science. Exactly. And these are big, all, all individually are big, big subjects, but SAS actually does all of that together. And I'm quite often asked by people who say, oh, it, it sounds too good to be true. It may, it maybe does, yeah. yeah. But I can tell you, whatever we're discussing is true. It's been around for forty years, and it's HMRC pension legislation. There's nothing in here that's been interpreted or bent or Aye, we're twisted. We're guessing at it, and this might work. Oh, nobody's challenged this. No, no, it's Correct. actually their own rules, it, it, their and own that's the point. Regulations. Um, so there's no, you know, there's no doubt that it might or might not work. Or that's why the rules. That's that's what the rules are. Yeah. If I do be work within the rules, and everything is is absolutely clean and tidy, and that's how it should be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're massively empowering tools, but. The, I think the key thing there, sort of in sort of summary of that, is the SAS combines your business mm -hmm. and its growth, your family and how they're protected and how they involve within that one structure, mm -hmm. and your pension all at the same same time. Yeah. And, and you have full control of all of that. So yeah, that's the real thing, isn't yeah. it? Because the amount of schemes where all you've done, you've just, you've just contributed. You've got no real choice. I know I've had a couple of corporate schemes in the past where you can you know, select from a drop down menu, or yep. I'll choose this type of scheme in the stock exchange, but yep. it's not me managing it. It's no. not me choosing the investment. And that, you know, something happens when it Brexit, well, it's, who knows what may happen, that market could lose an amount of value that you exactly. are exposed to. As much as it could in a SAS as well, and the SAS yeah. can invest within those same structures, uh, but typically they wouldn't have all the value in that, you'd, you'd, but you'd have the control of it. Yes, I could diversify it you know, in the way that I want to. And you can do a little bit of that with a SIP, for example. I'm not going to talk about right. SIPs in any depth, but SIPs are essentially the, the little brother of a SAS and, and could do some things a SAS could do, but they no longer can. That's been regulated out of the ah, SIP world. Right, okay. um, so SAS really is this last bastion of, of the flexibility you can have, but bearing in mind they are for business owners, yes. only they're not for Joe Public. Exactly. Touching upon that then, the fact that some things have changed, but SAS has been around for 40 years. Do you see any changes? Do you see further things in the pipeline? Um, not especially. No. SAS isn't a huge issue for the HMRC. They're yeah. not, I mean, apart from maybe some questionable investment schemes that have been around SAS, maybe shouldn't have been sure. in the first instance, but they sort of legislated them out. Um, I don't see any major pressure on it, subject to legislation can change at any government time. A change saying, of government can uh, change yeah, policy. But of course. it's not as if there's 10 million people who are taking advantage of a system that is disadvantaging yeah. anybody else. Um, it's just a structure that allows people who have a business to have a pension alongside it. And that's, that's really all there is, subject to whatever might happen in the future that none of us can predict.
Gotcha. Thank Brilliant you stuff. Yeah, there's a great wee get Just like that, another one. <laughs> that was well covered. Yeah. <laughs> right, tons of information there. That was fantastic. Uh, these guys and girls are probably going to be watching this a couple of times, I think. What did he say about that? But is that too wet? Is that really? I'm going to Google that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't Google it. Go for it. Yeah. Well, not anything. <laughs> um, we'll put around about this video some more materials uh, from Paul. We'll get some, get a wee presentation type yep. slide thing we can pop in Absolutely, for them. Yep. Just give you more of that, that background information uh, for your own research because we always say that you know do your own research uh, and then you can reach out but again and this we always stress this let's respect the man's time let's not be those amateur tire kickers that, oh i seen you in the video can i get a coffee no no let's do it properly let's form relationships when they should happen have you got one of those deals on standby is there a big commercial opportunity you're about to work with great is there a land deal that you've been, you know, notified uh, by Paul about, and you want to, you know, you've used some of your money for that, or around the family side, the whole kind of trust, the inheritance tax, etc. Has that opened a, a box in your mind that you want to seriously take it a bit further? If that's the case, then by all means, Paul will be happy to talk to you and answer any questions. But just make sure you you judge that right. If you're not clear in something, watch the video a couple of times. Uh, and then, of course, we've got our regular Zoom calls anyway, so if there's something in there you want to pop it, throw us the questions uh, and we can make sure we get the right answer from Paul so we don't annoy his time, but you can use it effectively. Uh, and hopefully we'll get the man to uh, come and speak to you live and direct yep. some of our land training events, for example. We'll try and arrange that because there's a massive op opportunity there for people. Yeah, 100%. Really I'm happy to do it. I'm delighted to do it. Yeah. It's always better to face to face people when you just explain these things in a bit more exactly. detail. But, exactly. Uh, Touch yep. upon. My question has been great, but you might have a better one. <laughs> <laughs> but again, so as well as the resources, there will also be a way to contact Paul on this wee section as well. So if you've reached that serious stage, you do want to kind of properly move something forward then get in touch. But uh, for this, for today, Paul, thanks a million. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Hi folks, it's Richard here again. I really hope that you enjoyed today's show. Now listen, I've got two links to help support you on your property journey. And I want you to write these down when it's safe to do so. You might be driving in your car just now listening to the podcast, and that's fine. But please make sure that you get back to this and write down these links. Okay. Are you ready? Got your pen in hand? So the first one, thisweekinproperty.com. Now that's the website for this podcast. On there, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss out. What you can also do on there is catch up on tons and tons of past episodes. There are hours and hours of property-related content and some amazing guests with some fantastic insights to help you on your property journey. So that is this week in property.com. Okay, next link, propertyprotege.com. Now, let me spell that one out for you. P-R-O-P-E-R-T-Y, P-R-O-T-E-G-E. -E. That's propertyprotege.com. Now, what's it all about? Well, the Property Protege Intensive is designed to give you the lift that you need into the world of property. And if you've already started, if you've already got some experience, then this can help you accelerate your progress even further. The experiences that people have had at Protégé and the success that they've achieved afterwards has been life-changing for many people. So go there right now if you're serious about property and if you want to build a highly successful property business. That's propertyprotégé.com so there you go. That's two links to some fantastic resources that are going to help you. And listen, talking about help, can you help me to help other people? You see, the more that we can share this podcast, then more people can learn from the fantastic guests that I've been so lucky to talk to. How can you help? Well, it's very simple and very quick. Just a short review on iTunes is going to help make that happen. If you go to thisweekinproperty.com forward slash iTunes, that will guide you to the very place that you will be able to help other people. So thank you. Thanks for doing that. And thanks for listening into the show. And I look forward to bringing another great guest to you in the next show. <laughs>